Discussion of common sexual side effects is an important part of the informed consent process before starting serotonergic antidepressants. How would you like to tell your patients they may have irreversible erectile dysfunction after taking SSRIs for only a few months or even a few days? Hi, Paul Zarkowski here with the Psychopharmacology Institute. Most of us consider the sexual dysfunction from SSRIs to be reversible, either by decreasing the dose, switching antidepressants, or adding a 5-HT2A blocker. Multiple case studies support the use of ciproheptadine, a 5-HT2A blocker, on an as-needed basis, specifically on date night, taken one or two hours before the onset of sexual activity. Trazodone, another 5-HT2A blocker, has been shown to reverse SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction in all four spheres when taken daily in an open-label study of 20 patients. But what if these studies were not large enough to capture individuals with irreversible sexual dysfunction? A group in Israel has attempted to answer this question with a very large database of 309,000 patients in the Tel Aviv district of Israel's largest HMO. I will jump ahead here and tell you that they found four cases of post-SSRI sexual dysfunction out of 866 men started on an SSRI after excluding all cases in which another cause could not be ruled out. The exclusions were many and filled a column and a half of small print, including any medical condition associated with erectile dysfunction, from cardiovascular disease to chronic kidney disease, any medications associated with erectile dysfunction, from beta blockers to immunosuppressants, they excluded anybody with a BMI greater than 25. They excluded anyone with a history of tobacco use or substance use disorders, and they excluded anybody over the age of 49 years, leaving a completely healthy group of 12,000 young men. That's right, your correspondent considers anyone less than 50 years old to be young. Of this group of 12,000 subjects, 866 were started on a serotonergic antidepressant, as mentioned before. 74 of those were started on a phosphodiesterase inhibitor to treat erectile dysfunction. But wait, 50 of those 74 had been started on a phosphodiesterase inhibitor before being started on an antidepressant, leaving only 24 whose erectile dysfunction could be caused by the antidepressant. Another 15 were excluded because the phosphodiesterase inhibitor was started more than a year after starting the antidepressant. Two of the remaining nine were still taking the antidepressant. Two were noncompliant and possibly still depressed, leaving four young men with erectile dysfunction that persisted more than a month after stopping the antidepressant in the absence of documented depression or anxiety. I agree with the author's effort to exclude cases with ongoing depression or anxiety. In a meta-analysis of 49 studies, exposure to depression was associated with a 1.39 times greater risk of erectile dysfunction. The reverse is even more striking in that exposure to erectile dysfunction increased the risk of depression by a factor of 2.92. This effect is mirrored in the study results as twice as many men were treated for erectile dysfunction before major depression than depression before erectile dysfunction. For this study, ruling out persistent depression or anxiety was based on the absence of a diagnosis in the chart. The authors state the validity of diagnoses in their database was found to be high in two previous studies. I would note these other two studies were based on the presence of a diagnosis in their database, not the absence. In reviewing these two other reference studies, one states that they were unable to assess the validity of diagnoses, and I quote, due to its service-based nature. The second reference states the main limitation of their study design is the lack of validation of included diagnoses. I emailed the corresponding author to clarify this point, but have received no response. Is this study evidence of a concerning but rare side effect? 
Or are those four cases out of a very large database due to the limits and accuracy of a service-based record? Informing patients they could have an irreversible sexual side effect could affect their willingness to agree to a trial, particularly in light of a tendency of human beings to overestimate the perceived probability of an unlikely event. Nevertheless, this result should be replicated in a large study with a more granular measure of depression or anxiety, specifically rating scales to verify remission. Although epidemiological studies have the benefit of a large sample size with a long duration of observation, the absence of a placebo group can make the results, particularly a report of an infrequent side effect, more difficult to interpret.